Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. John White, Chief Medical Officer at WebMD, and you're watching Cancer in Context. We've been talking a lot about different therapies that are used for cancer, but I also want to talk about the role of sugar. How does sugar impact the development of cancer, the treatment of cancer? So to find out the answers, I went to the world's leading expert. Joining me is Dr. Lewis Cantley. He is professor of cancer biology and medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine. Dr. Cantley, thanks for joining. It's a pleasure to be here and talk about sugar. Now, I have to tell you, I read that you have not eaten sugar in decades. Is that true? But what I do is I avoid foods that have sugar added to them. So avoiding all types of sugar, of course, is difficult because there's natural sugar ingredients in a lot of fruits. Fruits, for example, I eat fruits. And why are you doing this? Well, there, there are a number of reasons. Historically, I started doing it because I noticed back 50 years ago uh, that uh, a lot of my friends and colleagues from high school were you know, gaining a lot of weight. Uh, there was a huge change. I grew up in rural West Virginia. Okay. And back in the 50s when I was there, I didn't know anyone who was really overweight by today's standards, uh, much less obese. Yeah. Uh, and then through the 60s and 70s, uh, suddenly there was a gradual change that was quite noticeable by the, by the mid-70s already that almost everyone was overweight. And now a major fraction of people in West Virginia were obese. And I noticed that they were drinking a lot of sugary drinks uh, and ironically, a lot of diet drinks as well. They, mm -hmm. just, they were addicted to sweet things. They had to have sweet things all day long. So there was clearly this connection of addiction to sweet things that was driving consumption of food. So that's, I just decided I wouldn't you know, eat or drink anything that had sugar added to avoid that addiction. And that stuck with, stuck with that. So we know there's a relationship between obesity and certain types of cancer. And in actuality, those are some of the cancers that are increasing in incidence. And there's different theories as to why obesity is causing this increase, particularly in terms of inflammation, but you suggest that it's sugar. That's the cause. Is that right? Yes. And there are two mechanisms that we can get into some detail on. Uh, the cancer that correlates best with obesity is endometrial cancer. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the mutational events that cause endometrial cancer, they are events in a pathway that my laboratory discovered back in the late 1980s, uh, early 1990s. And what those mutations do are allow insulin to activate PI3K much more efficiently. And what PI3K does is it drives growth. It drives sugar intake, glucose intake, normal glucose intake from the bloodstream. Uh, and, and we know insulin drives glucose into muscle. This is how you maintain your normal glucose level in the body. Uh, and it suppresses glucose uh, production in the liver. Mm -hmm. And so that's how you maintain your normal glucose level. Insulin is critical. But we also know that insulin is required for the growth of almost all tissues. Not it's a pro hormone, correct, in terms of- the growth, it, Right, it is a form of growth hormone. It is, it is a, a growth factor, if you will. Uh, we know this because type one diabetics, who children who can't, whose bodies cannot make insulin, the first phenotype you notice is they fail to thrive. They're very small. Mm -hmm. They don't grow at a normal rate. And this is a consequence of not having enough insulin to drive growth of their tissues. As adults, insulin is primarily used to keep glucose constant, but during development, it helps tissues to grow. So if you hyperactivate PI3 kinase through insulin stimulation in tissues, you can drive the growth of cancers. And cancers will take up glucose 
better even than your muscle. And this is, uh, we use this in the clinic to visualize well, where tumor is. Is it insulin causing the increase in cancer and not directly sugar? Well, so the, you know, the blood sugar doesn't, uh, you know, we talk about high blood sugar. That's, that means it's a factor of two higher, mm -hmm. two to threefold higher than normal. So that's not a huge difference. The difference in glucose going into tumors is not because there's more glucose in the blood, although that contributes a little bit. It's because something's telling the tumor to take the glucose up. And this is that switch pathway that you're talking about. That's right. And it's okay. insulin generally that does it. Now, there are other growth factors besides insulin. Mm -hmm. Epidermal growth factor, for example, that can also tell uh, tumors to take up glucose. But insulin's better at doing that than any other growth factor. But let's talk about patients with type 2 diabetes who are insulin resistant. So they're pumping out a lot of insulin, especially early on. What are we seeing about the development of cancer at, at that stage? So that is the, the real danger stage is the stage of insulin resistance, as you indicated. Now, once one progresses from just insulin resistance to type 2 diabetes, that says that your, your islet cells in the pancreas cannot make enough insulin to keep up. And that's when people are typically diagnosed. But in fact, even before being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, many people are insulin resistant. They don't know they're insulin resistant because it's not easy to pick up that they have insulin resistance. And, and what do you say to people that are watching you that are thinking, and, and we've seen this around where people will say, sugar feeds cancer cells. So Is that it's accurate assessment. It's true that most tumor cells primarily use glucose to grow. But they can also use other amino acids and fats to grow. But typically they use glucose more so than these other nutrients. But we and can't make that correlation that people that eat a lot of sugary foods are more likely to develop cancer. We haven't made that straight correlation. Is that correct? Well, we know, no, we, endometrial cancer, absolutely clear. Endometrial, people, which is- Endometrial not, cancer, it's okay. very dramatic. But there's this trend in, uh, I would say more than a trend in breast cancer. Uh, and in fact, in many, many cancers, and we'll get to colorectal cancer in a minute because mm -hmm. it's a special case. But um, yes, it, there, there are many cancers that share this correlation. Uh, prostate cancer, for example, is uh, in advanced prostate cancer, the best prediction that you're going to have a short lifespan is that you gain weight after anti-androgen therapy. And that's, that correlates extremely closely with elevation of insulin, insulin resistance, uh, and the insulin now driving the growth of the prostate cancer. But some people suggest that the consumption of sugar is more important when we're talking about some of the chemotherapeutic agents and the impact in terms of receptors there, particularly in lymphomas and leukemias. It's more relevant there. Is that accurate? Well, I, I would say that the evidence for lymphomas and leukemias is not as good as in solid tumors. And, and again, it's about insulin. It's not about the level of glucose in the bloodstream. It's the fact that your pancreas has to spit out maybe 10 or 20 times as much insulin as normal in order to bring the glucose level back to normal. And that 10 or 20 increase, fold increase in insulin is more important than a two-fold increase in glucose in driving the glucose into the tumor. And if the tumor has mutations in this pathway that my lab discovered, it's going to respond to insulin much more dramatically than any other tissue in the body. So that sugar that you eat uh, or that el elevated glucose in your bloodstream, even if it's not elevated, even at a normal level of glucose, if your insulin is high, then it, and you have these mutations, that glucose is going to preferentially go into the tumor rather than into your muscle. It's really the issue of insulin then. And it's insulin is insulin relating to sugar, right? Which there are other aspects. But in terms of then 
how we should manage this. You've talked about the ketogenic diet, and, and I want you to, to kind of define what that is, because that's different than what some people are thinking in terms of the percent carbs. And some people say it should be 5% carbs, whereas most people consume 65% of their diet is carbs. What's the role of the ketogenic diet then in terms of either cancer prevention or in terms of cancer treatment? Yeah, so ketogenic diet, I, I like to call it an insulin sparing diet. An insulin sparing diet, okay. So, you know, it's that diet, the diet was originally designed, actually the diet really comes from uh, a, a way of treating uh, patients with epileptic seizures. So children who have epileptic seizure syndromes, it was noticed that if they had a birthday party and drank a lot of sugary drinks and lots of ice cream and cake, that they were very likely to have an epileptic seizure that evening. We now know that what causes epileptic seizures are mutations in PI3 kinase, the same gene that my lab discovered. And they happen in neuronal cells during development. So there's a cluster of neuronal cells in the brain that have that mutation in PI3 kinase. It's the same, very same mutation you see in endometrial cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer. It also can happen. It's not a cancer at that stage because it's in a non-dividing cell, a neuronal cell. Mm -hmm. It allows that neuronal cell to respond to insulin. So if you drink sugary drinks, insulin level goes up, that will fire those neurons and that will cause an epileptic seizure. Now, this was not known to, to explain why the sugary drinks and cake and ice cream was driving the epileptic seizures, because we only understood about five years ago that those, those neuronal clusters had PI3 kinase mutations. But in retrospect, it now all makes sense. Those mutations are allowing those cells to fire because of elevated insulin. So that's how the diet came about. It was called a ketogenic diet because the assumption was that it was the elevated ketones that's mm -hmm. protecting you. But in fact, I think the explanation is it's it, the, the decrease in insulin that actually is protecting, not the elevation in ketones. Now, Dr. Cantley, I want to follow up on this insulin sparing diet uh, premise. If that's the case, then why aren't more advocacy groups recommending uh, this type of diet for other patients at high risk for cancer or for those that actually are undergoing cancer treatment. No advocacy group rep recommends a certain type of diet, let alone an insulin sparing diet. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think it's pretty accurate, although we're starting to see changes um, as the message is beginning to get out. Uh, I mean, one concern that physicians have mm -hmm. is that uh, you know patients die with or if not of cachexia. So if you wasting. wasting, muscle wasting. And, you know, so a lot of the oncologists who are managing patients with cancer, with advanced uh, stages of cancer, are really worried that the patient is going to lose so much weight that their heart muscle, they lose heart muscle. And if you lose heart muscle, you're at very high risk of dying of a cardiac event. So that's why most physicians are telling their patients, you know, keep your weight up. And uh, the truth is that eating sugar doesn't really, you know, protect you from cachexia. You obviously have to eat something to stay, you know, to keep your weight up. Uh, but if you can keep your weight up without, it's harder, I should say, it's harder to gain weight without eating sugar. But uh, there are ways to maintain your weight without a very sugary drink. It could can, can be a slow release carbohydrate is fine. It doesn't raise insulin levels. A sugary drink will raise insulin instantly while eating, for example, uh, whole grain rice will take a long time, even though it's the composition is similar. It will take longer to digest it. And as a consequence, uh, the insulin levels won't go up as high. So there, there are ways to keep a pretty balanced diet. Uh, it doesn't have to be ketogenic uh, that will keep your insulin levels from rising. So my focus is in preventing insulin levels from going up, not from making ketones. Do you consider sugar a carcinogen 
Well, I wouldn't call it a carcinogen, but I, I'll give you an example. It's insulin. What would you call it? You know, let's let's think about why are we addicted to sugar? Sugar is, you know, historically in the evolution of humans and in fact most animals, the ability to eat and to be addicted to sugars was critical. And that was because we went through, most of humans have gone through seasonal availability of food. And before it was possible to can foods and store them in various ways, uh, whenever food ran out, you starved to death. And the only way you could stay alive through long periods of time with no, essentially no food available is to have some fat on your body. And by consuming fruits that are high in the mixture of glucose and fructose, it stimulates the appetite to eat food in general. And it's easier to put on weight if you make the food sweet. So naturally we are addicted to fruits. And it, since they're only available at the end of the growing season, you put on weight exactly when you need it. And that's why we evolved to be addicted to sugar. It, it allows us to gain weight. But the expectation is that you put on 50 pounds mm -hmm. and then you go through a period of about three or four months in which there's nothing to eat. And all of that 50 pounds goes away. So humans have gone through this starvation, gluttony stage throughout the history of the evolution of humans. And the difference is that today we never have that starvation period. So we can put on the weight, but it's harder to take it off because there's food always available. But also in fairness in the role of sugar, there's also the role of the endocannabinoid system, the role of dopamine in terms of the pleasure seeking hormones. There's also, you mentioned sugar, but in terms of central adiposity, there's also the role of leptin and ghrelin, those hormones that either tell us are hungry, that tell us they're, we're hungry or tell us we're full. And sometimes they get messed up. And there's the role of cortisol as well that's involved in this. And some people will say sleep and melatonin uh, and you know, orexin and other hormones have as much role in the development of obesity as sugar. So that's a long <laughs> statement. Uh, but what yeah. it comes to though is how do we know it's sugar that's causing these issues in, in terms of increased cancer incidence? Well, I'd say because historically, if you just go back and look, as I said, I grew up in rural West Virginia. 1950s, I didn't see anybody overweight. Almost everybody grew their own food uh, and um, canned their own foods, et cetera, et cetera. There wasn't a whole lot of, certainly no sugary drinks available at all, unless you squeezed your own orange juice. Mm -hmm. And even that was rare hundreds yeah. of years ago. So it's extremely modern event that there's rapid release carbohydrate in forms of sugary drinks in particular, suddenly rampantly available and cheap. Sugar was one of the most expensive things to get. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandparents, my grandmother, I remember mean, going to the store with her. She would save up her money to buy a five pound bag of sugar that would have to last the entire year. And she, you know, when she made a cake, it would be hard to be, tell it from a biscuit. It was not that sweet. Yeah. And uh, so I can tell you, sugar just was not consumed in the 50s and earlier. Uh, it's certainly in rural West Virginia, the way it's consumed today. But these are associated consumption yeah. and a huge increase in obesity. Yeah. In those same that's association, Dr. Cantley, not necessarily causation. Okay, so, so we can get to causation. We, we know the molecular mechanism by which this occurs because the, uh, the responses to having fructose plus glucose is, you know, ends up, as I say, raising insulin, but also allowing the fructose to go directly to the liver and be stored as fat. So even though glucose and fructose have the exact same calories per gram, they get behave in our body, they behave in different ways. The fructose is the one that makes it taste sweet pure glucose is not that sweet. So if, if we're taking this concept up, particularly you know, in sugar and insulin, and it's the amount of insulin, why don't we see a greater incidence in cancer in persons who are obese, overweight, pre-diabetic, because they're pumping out a lot of insulin as their islet cells and their pancreas start to fail? Well, in order to get a cancer, you still have to have a mutation. Mm -hmm. 
So, and that's pure luck, whether you get a mutation in the endometrium or in the breast or in the prostate. And so if you don't get a mutation, yes, you can be very obese. No mutation ever occurs, particularly it doesn't happen in PIC3 kinase gene or that pathway. Then yeah, you can get an obese and you, nothing will happen. A lot of people smoke cigarettes their entire life and never get a cancer. So there's no guarantee that being obese and drinking a lot of sugar is going to cause cancer. But if you happen to be unlucky enough to get a mutation, it's definitely going to accelerate the growth of that cancer and make it a, a much greater risk. So it's outcomes as much as incidents uh, where we see the influence of sugar. Why aren't more people talking about this? Well, I think they are, but uh, keep in mind, I, I'm, I'm a biochemist. So I, you know, a lot of people just study uh, food consumption with regard to observation. You just do correlation. You tell people to eat this or don't eat that. And then you ask them, are you adhering to what you said? And you follow them for five or six years, uh, you know, a thousand people. And then you trust that they did exactly what you told them to do. And then you write down what the results were. <laughs> That's not the way that I do research. I'm actually a biochemist. And I ask what actually happens okay. to the, the carbon atoms of glucose and fructose when they go into your body. How, you know, where do they get absorbed? Where do they go? What did it get converted into? Which ones raise insulin levels? We know that insulin will drive the, the PI3 kinase, the, the enzyme that I discovered, its role, it mediates everything that insulin does. It evolved for the purpose of driving growth by responding to insulin. And it's the most frequently mutated gene in cancer. So, you know, this is, a, this is all biochemistry that ex explains this is the way it works. But once you understand how it works, it makes perfect sense why what we're eating can start exacerbate the problem of driving the growth of the cancer. Well, we're going to have to continue this conversation about the role of various elements of our diet and the development of cancer. I really find it fascinating. And I want to thank you for taking the time today to come on and answer our questions. Okay. Very good. Nice to talk to you.